perform? Yeah. Can everyone online hear us all right? Yes, please just give us a thumbs up. All righty. So let's uh, roll call Maya. Uh, Mr. Alashewski. Here. Ms. Bendixson. Here. Ms. Bernalion. Here. Ms. Blanchard. Ms. Brown. Ms. Burks is online. Present. Mr. Cooley. Mr. Cooley. Dr. Day. Here. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Dr. Cluelling. Here. Uh, Mr. Green for Mr. Flixburg. Here. Ms. Hammerlevy. Here. Dr. Hershorin. Ms. Kessler. Here. Ms. Crawl. Mr. Miller. Dr. Moyer. Ms. Powers. Here. Thank you, Allie. Mr. Cr Mr. Pratt. Here. Mr. Johnson for Mr. Freeman. Mr. Provenzano. Here. Ms. Sussingham. Here. Chair, we have a quorum. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? There's no changes to the agenda. All right. So we have um, the minutes from the May 17th um, Management Board meeting. Are there any proposed changes to that or any discussion items that anyone wants to have on those minutes? Hearing none. Um, do we have to take a map number? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a motion to approve the May 17th Management Board meeting minutes. So moved. A second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this item? All those in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. Um, item three is citizen comments. Do we have any citizens or members of the public that would like to talk today? Hi, Nancy. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've seen you. Um, all right, seeing none, um, we'll move on to the first action item. So, Ed. According to the Tempe Bay Estuary Program bylaws, we were uh, uh, in need to hold elections every two years. Uh, so the management board chair and vice chair were last elected in 2022. Therefore, we're going to open up nominations for chair and vice chair for elections. I'll, I'll take over the proceedings until we have a national election. So I'd like to open up the floor to any nominations for vice chair to start. <laughs> don't, don't all speak up at once. <laughs> I will nominate myself to serve again. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? <laughs> Hearing no, can I have a motion to close nominations? So, and now we'll take a vote. Uh, is there a motion to accept Nan Flowung as vice chair? of the Tampa Bay Street Program Management Board. Motion. We got a motion and a second. Any discussion? What was the second? I'm sorry. It's super. Juanita was the motion. The... Who was the second? Second. Sarah, sorry. If it's not verbal, like, no, I, I, don't, I don't know if there was. So. Okay. It's super hard to catch. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. All right. aye. All right, we'll move on to uh, nominations for the Tampa Bay Estuary Program uh, Management Board Chair. Do I have any nominations? Nominate Kelly Levy to <laughs> serve as <the> chair. <laughs> Are there any other nominations? All right. For Jess? He's not here. Yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> we have a nomination of Kelly Levy and Bridges Preyman for Management Board uh, Chair. Are there any other nominations? And a motion to close nominations. So, second. <laughs> a motion and second to close nominations. Uh, we have. <laughs> we have two. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, members of the policy, our management board uh, for chair, Ms. Kelly Levy, can I have uh, a motion to nominate or uh, to elect uh, Kelly Levy for the Tampa Bay Estuary Program Management Board Chair? Okay. So today. Let's, let's, do I have a second? Second. Let's go ahead and take a vote. Aye. Aye. <laughs> and count those. It's unanimous. Okay. Except for <laughs> Roger. <laughs> <laughs> so, There's one in every room. So good to right? talk to Jeff when you did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost going to text him now. Did you? He's going to do this to <laughs> so I think by uh, a near unanimous vote, uh, Kelly Levy uh, uh, remains as Tampa Bay Estuary Program Management Board Chair. And Leanne Flowing uh, remains as Tampa Bay Estuary Program Vice Chair. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Come on, Leanne. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Happy to. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you all. So we'll move on to agenda item five, which is the initial fiscal year 25 program wide budget. Ed. So on page 11 of the packet is the overall anticipated budget for fiscal year 2025. And this is our program wide budget, which would begin October 1st of this year. Uh, our projections for next year, starting with expenditures on the bottom half of that uh, table. Uh, we're anticipating about 20% increase in overall expenditures, reaching to about 4.2 million. This is probably the largest budget we've ever had as an estuary program. It encompasses several new federal dollars that are coming into the, pro the program through bipartisan infrastructure law funding, as well as additional restore funding. So that's uh, a lot to uh, do with the increase that we're seeing this year. And we're anticipating some of the projects that aren't closing out this year to roll into the next fiscal year. Uh, so in total, our program operations, which includes our staffing of eight full-time and one part-time employee, our rent, as well as uh, contract services for legal support, uh, accounting and, and payroll services and auditing services, in total is about 1.2 million. Um, the remainder is uh, tied up in technical uh, and communications contract and consultant services to the tune of about 2.6 million, uh, bringing us to that, that grand total of about 4.2 in expenditures. As I mentioned, for revenues to meet those, that expenditure need, uh, we're seeing an increase in federal dollars next year by about 55% to the tune of about 1.8 million. About 800,000 of that or so is that new funding from bill and or restore sources uh, above and beyond our traditional work plan grants. And then uh, we'll have our, our, our traditional membership dues as, as identified in our interlocal agreement that uh, match some of those federal dollars. Any difference we make up with the in-kind revenue project in this year, uh, going into fiscal year 2025, City of Tampa, as well as uh, projects that we haven't uh, collected uh, in-kind for in prior work plan years, will make up that 50-50 uh, match for a fiscal year 2025 work plan to the tune of about $300,000. So in total, we're expecting about 3.6 million in uh, revenues, and we make up any differences in total expenditures with revenues we we've already collected in prior fiscal years um, uh, to meet that $4.2, $4.2 million expenditure um, and anticipated budget for next year. Uh, just one thing to mention in terms of our, our direct personnel services, I did factor in health insurance increases that we're anticipating. Uh, we got uh, a notice that our health insurance is going to go up by about 3%. I've also factored in cost of living adjustments as well as raises for staff uh, up to about 5%. And that's always based on merit and I can individually adjust across uh, different staff members. But I did factor that into the, our direct uh, personnel and uh, salary costs for this year. Other than that, you know, the other major thing to, to point out is that our public digit mailing uh, is, is going up. And that's just due to some of the community surveys that uh, we're anticipating conducted that like, it will be running uh, for the estuary program over the next several years. So other than that, we've tried to trim in other areas. Uh, but like I said, this is the largest budget we've ever had as an estuary program. And it's largely due to that, those new federal dollars coming into the program. 
So I'll stop there and see if anyone has any uh, additional questions on the anticipated budget for fiscal year 2025 or particular line items. Um, is any of the federal funding ARPA? Uh, it's to the IIJI bipartisan infrastructure law funding that's coming through the national estuary programs. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we got a we got a weird email from DEP yesterday because we got a grant from them that is actually passed through dollars and um, because of the the restriction, you know, we all have to have that encumbered by December of 2024. Uh, they're like, if you want any changes, even to a project manager's name or anything that it doesn't even affect the funding piece of it, they want it done before then because their lawyers have advised that um, any any type of amendment to those contracts, the funding would be yes. lost. So I just the bipartisan infrastructure yeah. law funds are subject to clawback, and we are struggling to complete contracts with many of you as our partners. And so you should understand that the more quickly we can execute these agreements, the safer those funding um, sources will will be. But these are not ARPA funds. But the, okay. I think I think the federal government is you know sort of preparing for what what a legislative body might look like, and the executive branch might look like after the elections this year. Right now we have four of the five years the bill funding that would be coming through the national estuary programs in. At least an agreement or anticipated agreement with EPA. The fifth year of funding uh, we would submit uh, probably towards the the tail end of this year. Any other questions on the fiscal year twenty twenty five budget? No other questions for Ed. We have there's an action um, recommend the policy board. Adopt the initial fiscal year 25 program or budget. Second. Got a motion and a second. Did you get that? All good. I got the second. Well, who Stacey? Stacey. 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 I'm going to need you to put forward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any additional conversation? Questions? If hearing none, all those in favor? All right. All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed. All right, item six is the quarterly financial report. So this is our current stress as, as of this fiscal year through the third quarter, which ended June 30th. Um, if you look at the far right corner, normally you know, we're anticipating to be about 75% in terms of revenues and expenditures. Uh, I'll go down again to the bottom on the expense side. We're pretty much uh, at or below that 75% level for the majority of our line items, meaning that will probably come under budget for a lot of our operational costs. But also to note, we're only about 50% at our tech and columns, contracts, and consultant services. Uh, those are our remain project delays. And as I mentioned, some of those projects would roll into the next fiscal year and account towards some of our expenditures that we anticipated for fiscal year 2025. And of course, any expenditures that we would realize this fiscal year, we're going to meet those with uh, anticipated revenues. That's why we're a little bit short in terms of anticipated revenues as well, because a lot of our grants are cost reimbursement. Uh, so whatever activity that we uh, encumber in terms of expenses and revenues will bring back as a final budget at the next November board meeting, uh, but we're likely to come in uh, below on both accounts um, at, at that November meeting for fiscal year 2024. Uh, with that, I, I did have a couple of footnotes, and, and these are largely ones that I've explained at the prior meetings in terms of where our expenses are at. So our volunteer services were, were remain a little bit over what we projected going into this uh, fiscal year, and that's largely uh, from a, a additional angler incentives that we um, purchased at the beginning of this fiscal year, and then we also supported some additional volunteer events for partners. Uh, so other than that, you know, like I said, we're we're well below or uh, at that seventy five percent level in in terms of our uh, traditional expenses. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop and answer any questions that you have on our current uh, status of our financial CQ3 of this year, 2024. Any questions for Ed? Nice. There is coffee in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> Kathy, right? All right, so we have an action item uh, recommend that the policy board accept the quarterly financial report. So we have a motion. motion. Do we have a second? Second. 
All right, we have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, I have, uh, agenda item 7, 2027 Reasonable Assurance Plan Update Contractor Selection. So over the last quarter, we advertised for contractual support for update of the 2027 Reasonable Assurance uh, plan that we deliver to DEP and EPA on a every five-year basis. Uh, this next update would encompass the 2022 through 2026 period, and we've delivered that to DEP by the end of 2027. And basically what that entails is this, uh, synthesizing the loading information, the water quality conditions, and projects that partners are implementing through the Tampa Bay Nitrogen Management Consortium in order to meet those water quality targets that we've established for the benefit of improving seagrasses. And this is in a, a, a uh, group that we facilitated going back to the 1990s, and we've always used contractor support to help us uh, develop that reasonable assurance documentation. Uh, this year, when we put out the bid, we received three proposals uh, from German Carpenter, Environmental Science Associates, and Stantec Consulting Services. Uh, we assembled an evaluation committee of five members, of which um, all of them are, are part of the Nitrogen Management Consortium, as well as some staff uh, with our program. And uniformly, the top rank respondent uh, from those reviewers was Environmental Science Associates, who demonstrated that um, they had the best knowledge of what was needed for this grant proposal and also had team members that have actually done some of this work for the program in the past. So my recommendation is to move forward with a contract with Environmental Science Associates uh, for an amount not to exceed $240,634, which was also actually the low uh, bid for for uh, this RFP. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, open up the floor if there is any questions in terms of the quality of the proposals or the anticipated work under this this uh, um, uh, this project. Any questions? Seriously, guys, caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, so we have two items under this agenda item. The first one is to recommend the policy board authorize the executive director to negotiate the scope and enter into a contract with the top rank respondent, Environmental Science and Associates, for an amount not to exceed $240,634. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. A passes. Item B is to recommend the policy board authorize the executive director to amend scope, timeline, and budget up to $25,000 if additional funds become available. Do you have a motion? So moved. Second. And second? Okay. Any further discussion? I do have one question. Could you maybe just talk for a minute about what are the guardrails on that approval? Yeah, I, I apologize, I didn't bring it up. So there was uh, some um, comments from the review committee that the proposal that we received from Environmental Science Associates was a little bit high in terms of the overall effort and cost allocation for task one, which was the developing of loads uh, over the five year period. Uh, we feel that the ESRI program has made some progress in generating some of those estimates. So a lot of the uh, feedback from the review committee was uh, in those negotiations with environmental science associates to retask some of that level of that effort and cost from task one to actually preparing the reasonable assurance document in task five. So that that approval and what we'd recommend to the policy board in the negotiations, we would uh, you know uh, suggest that we move some level of effort from task one to task five. But that FERT B is a standard a standard yeah. request that we include um, because that's within Ed's, the executive director's authority um, to to amend um, up to that twenty five thousand dollar level. So we would only do that if there was additional yeah. work that was warranted and that the funds. Yeah, that was that was the key thing, the key question, like from a governance perspective, that that's within your authority to do. Yeah. 
And I'll just offer for a little context too, we, we raise these funds and pool the, the resources of the members of the Nitrogen Management Consortium. We're currently a little bit short of this $240,000 level, but we're still waiting on some of those contributions to trickle in. They're not due until October. But if you are one of those entities that hasn't made their contribution yet, we would appreciate it because it gives us more confidence as we enter into this agreement. Okay. Any additional questions or discussion on this item? Just that point clarification. Yeah. So if it's already within your purview to do it, do you need this recommendation or why is this recommendation needed? So as Maya mentioned, this is if we had additional funds within the 240,000 bid amount, we would negotiate sort of that cost reallocation. So we weren't we wouldn't be adding any additional funds unless they present themselves between now and, and after the contract is probably already agreed upon. I think it's also a matter of transparency. We don't want you all to approve a contract for 240,000. And then if you find out that, you know, in fact we're, you know, have 250,000 under contract with them, we want you to know that you sort of that was part of it all along and it just gives us a little bit of flexibility. Okay. And this is something that you do with other contracts as well, right? Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's yeah, our it's standard. Thing. standard. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or discussion items? Just one suggestion. You're welcome to take all of the subparts together and you don't need separate motions for each. Okay. <laughs> This time we ended up with questions. So no, no, it's fine. I would just if, we did it. if we if we weren't if you weren't certain about yeah. that, I just wanted yeah. to clarify that you're welcome to take yeah. take them as a group. You're not right. obligated to. So after that discussion, do we have? Are we uh, actually we already had a motion and second? So um, all those in favor? All right. All right. Any opposed? All right. Motion passes. All right. Amended and restated Florida Estuaries Alliance. MOB. Yeah, so this item back in 2016, the four National Estuary Program directors signed on to the initial uh, memorandum of understanding for the Florida Estuaries Alliance. And since the time actually it's, it's left, uh, it lasted for five years. And over this past summer, the NEPs met again and thought it would be a good idea to reinvigorate and um, sign on to this MOU again. Basically allowed us to speak with one voice to our state and federal elected officials on priority issues that face all of our, our coastal programs in the state of Florida. It also opens the door for uh, expanding collaborations with other entities working on coastal issues throughout the state. So this year, uh, what we're proposing is uh, an amended and restated MOU, which updates the list of, of collaborators that we're looking to work with as a Florida Estuaries Alliance. But really, um, the core group that would be signing on again would be the four NEPs. Uh, in addition to the, that update, we also look to add two clauses, uh, a sunshine review clause, which would allow the MOU to persist if all the parties agreed on every five-year basis so that we wouldn't have to come back for an approval to sign on again in the future. And then all, we also included a joinder clause for those uh, potential collaborators that we've identified throughout the state if they wanted to sign on to the MOU so we wouldn't have to come back for future approval as well. So those were the major changes that and updates to the original MOU that we're proposing here, but I'm looking for approval uh, and a recommended policy board approve the amended and restated Florida Estuaries Alliance MOU. Uh, recommend the policy board authorize me as director to provide the potential collaborator collaborators list if needed prior to full execution of all uh, the Florida Estuary Alliance signatories, and then recommend policy board authorize me to sign the, the MOU to fully execute with the other four NEP directors. Um, with that, I'll, I'll stop and can open the document if you had any specific questions I could highlight the, the changes in more, uh, in, in more depth if that's needed. Does anybody have any questions for Ed on any on A, B, or C related to the MOU? So in the in the past, has I'm not I'm not against this. I'm just curious. Yep. I'm just asking my question. Um, has this been helpful in going to 
federal issues and state issues? Has this been helpful having one voice? Yeah, so usually when I come to the November meeting, I bring legislative priorities, and the legislative priorities are usually in line with all four of the NEPs, and these are sort of the, the one voice we're speaking from on the core issues that we're, we're trying to educate elected officials on. And they're usually centered around needs of each of our partners. So continued funding and investment in stormwater, wastewater infrastructure, continued investment in habitat restoration uh, and acquisition that supports our HMPUs, monitoring to uh, understand the status and trends of each of our estuaries. So it's those sort of core messages that we bring as the Florida Estuaries Alliance, both state and federal elected officials. And hopefully that that results in you know a greater awareness of the needs of each of our estuaries, um, but collectively throughout the state of Florida as well. When you go and visit some of the elected officials, do you guys ever go as a group or is it more individual? Yeah, uh, primarily when we were we were always up in DC in the spring, and then prior to COVID, we used to go up to to Tallahassee, but we're probably going to. We start doing that more often um, for the state side, um, going up to Tallahassee as a group of four NEPs. Yep. Yeah. So maybe this hasn't happened, maybe it'll never happen. But if the four entities are working together to form a consensus to take to policymakers, and you don't get a consensus, how does that work? Or how has that worked? Uh, I think, you know, we are, we still, individually represent the interests of each of our estuary programs. So like when we have core issues, as an example, we talk about like causeway alterations in old Tampa Bay, you know, that's a very niche thing for our program. And I'm, I'm still speaking to that issue, uh, but collectively there's other hydrologic al alterations or, or projects that there's interest from the other estuary programs. So funding towards the, uh, the Everglades and some of the restoration activities there. Um, it just allows us to sort of speak the same narrative and hopefully resources that are going to the Everglades and those projects will also come to our program as well um, because we share some of those core and same issues. Any additional discussion on this item? None. Um, do we have a motion to approve action items A, B, and C? Motion. Oh, second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, executive director and staff reports. Yeah, just a couple of quick updates for you all. Um, I just wanted to let the management board know that um, uh, Don Con is actually going to be retiring at the end of November. He gave us a notice of this past quarter. This is not a surprise. We kind of knew it was, it was coming, um, but he did give us some fair warning. He'll be attending uh, the November um, uh, policy board meeting and this, this upcoming August uh, policy board meeting. Um, but he has given us a recommendation uh, for, for uh, soliciting additional counsel after he leaves, and we uh, started uh, some discussions with Jan McLean, who's now at Gray Robinson. She was the city of Tampa legal counsel. Uh, so she has some familiarity with the program, but certainly we want to give this opportunity to both the management and policy board. If there's other firms or other counsel that you would suggest we, we talk to you uh, over the next quarter, we'd be happy to do that. My goal would be coming back to the November meeting with uh, a new agreement so that it would be a seamless transition from when Don retires at the end of November to bringing on a new council starting December 1st, and we'd get that approval at the November board meeting. Um, so, like I said, any any suggestions that you have in terms of uh, soliciting additional quotes um, from other legal counsel or firms are welcomed. Uh, you can just send me an email. This is something that we don't necessarily have to go out for bid in form to state procurement policy for legal services, but uh, again, I'm, I'm here to welcome any suggestions you might have uh, for our legal counsel moving forward. Um, other item I just want to mention, um, been kind of talking about this over several meetings, we, we're still anticipating some uh, large restore funding coming into the program to help support uh, the old Tampa Bay stormwater priority project uh, identification and implementation. Uh, we awarded uh, some additional restore funds uh, and received that notice back in December 2022. 
actually received some of the contract uh, agreement language over the in early June and partially executed and sent it back to DEP. I'm still awaiting uh, the fully executed agreement back from them. Uh, they mentioned that some of the terms and conditions might have changed with the start of the state fiscal year, so they're waiting on those uh, potential changes to uh, matriculate into that agreement. But we are currently advertising for this work, and my hope is that um, we will have a contractor selection at the November board meeting to start start this work because it, it is long overdue, and we know we need to get moving on additional work to prevent and uh, reduce nutrient loads uh, through stormwater sources in the old Tampa Bay watershed. So really hopeful that this this will kickstart a lot of the, the need in that in that sub basin. Uh, so again, I'm hoping to come back at the November board meeting with a, a contractor selection recommendation uh, based on the RFP we currently have advertised for that work. And please help get the word out about the RFP. Yes, yeah. Please share widely. Uh, and then last but not least, we also have been made aware uh, by DEP and third parties that we we're set to receive uh, an additional $75,000 from the settlement agreement to support monitoring in and around the Piney Point facility during uh, closure. Um, we were made aware of this uh, probably several weeks ago, and it's since that time we've, we've talked with the University of South Florida, who has established some real-time monitoring stations throughout the Bay, actually, in response to the, the initial Piney Point um, uh, breach. They have four to five stations online now within the Bay proper. And we've been talking with them about establishing a new station in Bishop's Harbor. And that real-time station would hopefully give all parties assurance that during the full closure process of Piney Point, there'd be no additional water quality issues in the surrounding environment. Uh, so we'll use that money, hopefully, to, to see at least the equipment purchase then we're, we're trying to work with USF to continue that ongoing uh, real-time monitoring network as long as possible and, and looking for other grant uh, resources to continue the, the O&M costs for, for the operating the stations in the Bay. I just wanted to bring those items to everyone's attention. And I don't know if anyone had any questions on those, but that concluded our uh, director report. Um, the Technical Brian here? No, we we'll see him. Okay. All right. He can on you. All right. So do you like you do you have like a you know, you keep in tally? I think he owes me a few. So <laughs> I told him he need, he definitely needs to help you out at the tax meeting for sales, but we need you here to chair this meeting. <laughs> You did yeah. message me this morning. Yeah. I'll I'll read them for you. No, all right. <laughs> all right. So um on uh, page 17, um, you'll see the uh, technical advisory committee report. I won't go over everything, but just some things to highlight. Note that um, under the technical reports and peer reviews, the um, task one, um, part of the old Tampa Bay Assimilated Capacity Project link is there. Um, the, the Seagrass Transect training results, obviously we're gonna be kicking that off this fairly soon. If storms don't wash us away. Um, so just very important that we're, you know, in sync there, being consistent, ensures the data is good. Um, there's six presentations there um, to take a look at field work. Again, um, a lot of, um, you know, seagrass and, and fishery sampling. Um, and then the three committee meetings. Um, so if you have any specific questions about those, the staff are here to answer questions, but um, they do produce a lot of work each quarter. So hopefully you're taking a moment to take a look at that work. And um, again, I will put out the plea to make sure you're staying active in the TAC and that you're encouraging your new employees to join us and, um, and be part of the future of the estuary program, because I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my staff are a little upset that I already have a countdown clock. <laughs> so I'm um, upset by that too. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, moving on to the community advisory committee report. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so the community advisory committee met. Uh, we met at the end of June virtually, and we heard this presentation from the Golden Mangrove winner, um, very dedicated people who are taking care of Mirror Lake. 
and St. Pete. Um, CIC members volunteer 54 hours this quarter. Um, you'll see the events. There was a lot of events every month all around the watershed area. Um, two of the Bay mini grants have been completed and there are 27 ongoing uh, mini grants. Also media interviews and presentations. It's been That wraps it up. That wraps it up. All right. Um, project highlight communications plan, Carly. Yeah, Carly's going to give a presentation uh, as part of our interim update of the CCMP. We, we thought it wise to uh, refresh and update the communications plan that was developed that, on the tail end of the 2017 CCMP update. So, uh, Carly's going to highlight our activities that we're planning for over the next five years. And give me just a second, Carly, I'll bring your presentation up. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go over our 2024 to 2029 communication plan. This is just for information. There's no action requested at this time. But the last plan was in place from 2018 to 2023, um, and the communication team at the time was able to accomplish a lot of the goals that were in that plan. And in 2017, they introduced the new logo and went forth with a rebrand of the program that aligned all of our products with that logo, the styling, and colors, things like that. Um, we started to think about participatory science, which led to the TBAG Index event, uh, which uses buried TBAGs as a proxy to study decomposition in different environments. Um, that event allowed citizens to participate in the research we were doing and did lead to publication in the peer reviewed uh, literature. In 2019, we joined both Instagram and LinkedIn. As we all know, social media changes constantly. Uh, Instagram at the time was the best platform um, to get engagement. We are still seeing that now. Instagram is getting the most engagement for us. Um, LinkedIn has been helpful to connect with professional audiences for recruitment for employment and RFPs. We underwent a website refresh in 2020 uh, to modernize and make the website more user-friendly. We also produced two State of the Bay reports in 2019 and 2022, as well as creating a web-based version of the State of the Bay to work in conjunction with that print version that was being produced. We also started the Private Lateral Sewer Line Behavior Change Campaign, or the Pipe Up Campaign, which we will be continuing with this current communications plan, and I will talk about that a little bit later. We also increased Tarpon Tag and by mini grant advertisements to reach a broader audience and try to bring more people into the program. Uh, in our planning sessions, we identified four major communication priorities, science literacy, outreach engagement, support training and capacity building, and behavior change. You're not looking to move in a significantly different direction from the previous plan. Um, we'll still be completing activities that are approved under the CCMP and the strategic plan. Rather, we just wanted to align our efforts as a communication team and direct where we spend our resources and time to create meaningful communication. Our day day for the Bay events have been occurring for some time. Um, we do recognize that many other organizations in the watershed have these trash cleanup events, garden planting events. And so we wanted to find our niche that was a little bit different from what they were doing so that we were not duplicating efforts with our other partners. Um, to do this, we're going to emphasize participatory science in our events, like I said, with the TBAG index to really allow people to be involved with the research that we're doing. And hopefully this will continue to allow us to publish the findings from those events in the peer-reviewed literature. We'll continue to have trash-free waters cleanup events, and we'll use the Safe Trash Assessment Protocol to collect data from those events and further research in that area. Also continue State of the Bay reporting. The next State of the Bay will be out next spring. Um, we're hoping to use our routine monitoring that we are already reporting on in that um, and kind of distill it for a broader audience so it's more accessible for the various different stakeholders that we uh, work with. We'd like to create a briefer, briefer than we have been, overview of those indicators that we're tracking um, that could be updated on an annual basis to provide a more timely um, report of what the state of the bay is. 
Uh, we'd also like to update the web version to integrate more seamlessly with the print version, uh, make them look a little more similar so it's easy to go from one to the other. Oh, I need permission. Uh, with social media, like I said, we'll continue to um, <laughs> we'll continue to use the platforms that we're finding the most engagement on, which is still Instagram at this time. Um, on Instagram Reels right now are the uh, most engaged with posts. Um, so if you didn't see, we recently created a reel to advertise one of our new papers that came out, the Hot and Fresh paper about temperature and salinity in Tampa Bay. And you can all watch it on your own time on our Instagram since it won't work here, unfortunately. Um, but we got Marcus in the Bay with a pizza box, so it's a good time. <laughs> We'd also like to uh, increase interactive posts on social media with um, quizzes on Instagram stories to test people's knowledge, give us a better idea of what our audience knows, doesn't know, what we may need to educate them on, um, as well as challenges either to post a photo or answer a question, things like that. Uh, we'll continue our core behavior change, change campaigns during this time. We'll be evaluating the current Be Floridian messages to see what's working, what's not working, if we need to change anything moving forward. We'll also be launching some new messages for that pipe up campaign, the private lateral sewer line inspection. Uh, we'll have some rotational campaigns. We're going to be refreshing the Scoop the Poop branding uh, to bring that back to the forefront. We've had a lot of requests for that. And we'll leave capacity open to address new issues as they arise. One of the new things in this plan is we're planning to implement an ambassador program where we would work with leaders in some of our priority community or communities to um, bring our priorities and key messages back to their community members. This would allow us not only to bring our message to them, but they could come back with information from their communities, whether it's issues that they're facing or the best ways to communicate some of our campaigns to them. Um, as a staff of nine, we can't be everywhere at once, so this will allow us to increase our capacity to do some more tabling events and um, really address some of those priority audiences that we've identified. We'll also be able to reduce some of those barriers that we've identified for our community driven projects like the grants. We've identified a key audience of elected officials that we'd like to prioritize uh, during this period. Um, like Ed said, we'll continue our DC visits um, to the legislature and schedule some Tallahassee visits. Uh, we will work with the policy board to identify legislative priorities at that time and provide support to have unified messaging for some of those key topics as it was. We'll continue to support the Association of National Estuary Programs by participating in their campaigns, I Heart Estuaries and Estuaries Week. Those are both social media campaigns that raise awareness of estuaries uh, to try to increase appropriation. Um, we will be up for reauthorization during this period. We're currently authorized through 2026. Um, and the uh, FDA programs are currently authorized at a million dollars per program. Um, the appropriations are set at 850000 per program. Um, so we'll engage with elected officials to really um, encourage that support for the reauthorization. We'd also like to include more experience-based tours for elected officials so they have a more hands-on way to experience the watershed and see how important it is. That was a very brief update of everything that's in there. There's a lot more in the plan, so please feel free to look at it on your own time. Um, and if you have any questions, thanks. I have I have two questions. Okay. Um, you said a you're creating a more brief state of the bay. Like, I mean, that that's like the one page information. Like, how? How are you going to make that more brief? The state of the bay is not one page. It's currently almost 40 pages. So oh, is that what you're thinking? Not like the little annual. Not that, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> like, because that little one page, I feel like it's, has well, a page, 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 no. but it's all good. Okay. Yeah. 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 So um, something more like that, that has that information, but is a little okay. bit. Okay. Um, and then my other thing is, and I know this costs money, so I know. Um, but the Be Floridian campaign, when you first launched it, like it had the billboards, I remember seeing the commercials, and that was pre-COVID, like, that was a long time ago. It was, it was even right? way more than pre-COVID. Yeah, yeah. So it was like 2011 at launch. Of, of, <laughs> like, all the new people we have in this area to be able to, like, kind of 
make that big again and remind people and have like all the new residents that are here now that are like, yeah, this is why we moved here to go fishing and boating. And um, I just think that would be really great to like redo the big, the big piece already in of, of billboards and commercials and stuff. Yeah, it is set aside in the budget um, for some of that marketing. Um, that's kind of why we want to figure out which messages are working best before we spend all the money on a big billboard, figure out what is really speaking to people mm -hmm. the most about those. Like, anything you want to add on that? Um, yeah, I think that's exactly the rationale that we have for this. Um, the, the research, the market research done for the 2011 launch was done in 2009. So that's already 15 years ago, right? That we were started. So it's exactly thinking about, you know, like the composition of the residents in the area may be very different than it was 15 years ago. Also thinking about now that there are more ordinances in place in the different counties, now thinking about how you know, where does Beef Floridian sit next to these different messages, um, you know, from different sources. And also the last time, I think in 2015 was the last time there was research done looking at um, homeowners' uh, knowledge of Beef Floridian. And I think it was somewhere between 40 to 50% of homeowners had at least heard of Beef Floridian before. So now there's this kind of, you know, question of, you know, okay, if, you know, about half of the homeowners have heard of it, where does it sort of stack up? And, you know, if they see the Floridian, is it now going to be less uh, eye-catching because they are so used to it? So do we need to completely rebrand to get that attention back? Or is it worth, you know, capitalizing on something that's already ingrained in that knowledge base? So yeah, that's exactly the, the rationale for, for the rebound. Mm -hmm. Questions, do you guys do Facebook also? Yes, we do have a Facebook Facebook, uh, we post a lot of good stuff on Instagram on there, and uh, we do a lot of partner sharing. <laughs> okay, okay so yeah, because we would love to have Instagram, but right now we just have Facebook, and you know our communications group is a little reluctant for some reason. But if you're getting better response on Instagram, we'll share that with them and maybe. I think, I think you all actually get pretty good engagement on your on environmental news on Facebook. Yeah, so I it's, think it's a different audience. You know, you get the younger people on Instagram. And the you don't even people. get the younger people. You, know, you get the people that are like, they're, they're. <laughs> How do we reach you? <laughs> the, the, the 20 year olds you're chasing now on a different platform altogether. I mean, that's the whole thing. I, I think it was surprising to our staff as well when I pointed out, hey guys, we started Instagram and LinkedIn in 2019. I'm like, what? <laughs> These things evolve so quickly. Yeah, we do get good. Um, and you know what really our environmental, Pinellas County Environmental News Facebook page, it didn't get a lot of, I mean, we had our choir, right? Yeah. When it exploded, I part Oh, man, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, Keep um, it was red. I hate to say this. It was red tide. Well, that's driven our engagement on Instagram. Actually, in, in 2018, that red tide event. That's where we were posting out all of the monitoring results and all of the updates related to fish cleanup and everything. And and people just went there in droves and. And a lot of people haven't left, so we're still we still have. It was tiny point for us. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you keep them? What you got? Them? Yes. It's it's about pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is like kind of I like we've been challenging ourselves to to sort of be entertaining and how we get people sort of you know open to the idea of reading a, a paper that's been published in the peer review literature. And apparently, pizza boxes <laughs> and silly videos. Like really do kind of open that up. So have you guys followed? I'm sorry, the National Park Service. Yeah. Um, okay. Actually, I my plug is to the Washington State of Washington DOT. I think that theirs is public public works perfection. You should definitely okay, look at that. Okay. Okay. So now I will look at that. I'm just sitting here going, how do we? You know, maybe we should. You know, have some sort of virtual communications 
uh, meeting with these folks and see how, you know, I'm just, hey, if they're great, why not, you know? What is, is it the Minnesota DOT that named their snow plows? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like snowing beauty. Okay. <laughs> So how, what boats do you have that you guys could name your boats? Like have the company no. snow boats? Oh, we could call uh, sweet boats. We, we could name our street sweepers. We all have street sweepers. We all have street sweepers. Come on, guys. Well, and the thing the thing to think about is part of our strategy has always been one to amplify your your voices as our partners. And so like if there's things, Casey, where y'all don't have an Instagram page. Um, but you know, if we could like host something where we're getting messages out for you all on those platforms, we're more than happy to because that just helps fill you know content out. And I think yeah. overall our goal is not only to keep people that learn about the street parking, but to expand to other uh, communities and groups that are unaware of the street program as well. And how do we get beyond the echo chamber that a lot of social media represents right now? So that. I think is some of our strategies moving forward for the next five years, expanding the congregation rather than to preaching to the, the same choir. Well, and to enhance science literacy too, because even amongst you know the choir that we all work with, there's room, there's there's a science literacy gap that we can all work towards improving. And so we've kind of tried to focus what we spend the most of our time on and on things of how can we make science content engaging and accessible so people are actually learning more about the bay and the resources. I actually have a question about the key communities that you mentioned, like bringing a representative to, what are those communities specifically? Are you looking at people who are, you know, new residents or specifically coastal residents? I don't, I mean- Our I priority, the priority communities that we've identified in like our stakeholder outreach documents and things like that are primarily businesses, rural communities, and then underserved and overburdened. So those are our primary. There. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Kelly, I was just going to mention um, it's national parks out west. Uh, I think the airport does a really good job with their accounts. I don't know if you've seen Which it. Which airport? Cape International. Oh, T uh, yeah, yeah, TIA does. Yeah. I, the guy with the National Park Service makes me cry. Yeah. Uh, some of his posts are just like insane. I, I started following him personally on LinkedIn <laughs> just so that I can see his personal posts because he's got to be as entertaining yeah. there yeah. as he is, you know, on uh, Facebook. So, um, awesome. So, we, uh, Nancy Norton is here with the uh, Southwest Florida Water Management mm -hmm. District to give us an overview of the Boyd Hill Hydrologic Restoration Project. Nancy, just let me know when you want to advance the slide. Uh, again, this is a project that is funded through the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund partnership with the Water Management District and City of St. Pete. Thanks, Nancy, for being here, giving an overview of where you guys are at. Great. Well, you guys have been sitting here for a while. Does everybody just want to stand up straight? <laughs> sure. Don't you? Oh, God. I saw there was talking in the back. Is there anybody want to wake up? Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Don't yeah, answer no. chair yoga. I apologize. Yeah. I'm going to be reading a lot. <laughs> uh, but okay. um, I want to thank you for inviting me to talk to you about the Boyd Hill project. Uh, as I've been introduced, I'm Nancy Norton with the um, with the uh, district, the Southwest Florida Water Management <laughs> District Swim Plan. Uh, that's the Surface Water Improvement and Management Plan or program. I've been with the district about 17 years now, always working in SWIM, and uh, I'm a senior professional engineer in the program. So um, this project includes funding, as Ed mentioned, from uh, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, and that's probably the good reason why I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> so, uh, this is the next slide is um, um, sort of a word from our sponsor. 
The South Pleasant Florida Water Management District is one of five water management districts created in 1961 as a result of concerns for Hurricane Donna. The Water Resources Act defined four missions, water supply, flood protection, water quality, and natural systems. In 1987, the Florida legislature created the Surface Water uh, Improvement and Management, or the SWIM Act to protect, restore, and maintain Florida's highly threatened surface water bodies. Under this act, the water management districts were directed to identify a list of priority water bodies within their authority and implement plans to improve them. The program works with partners, including federal and state agencies, local governments, and other organizations, as well as the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Uh, our SWIM program here in Southwest Florida Water Management District identified 12 priority water bodies, three coastal estuaries, five first magnitude spring systems, and four lake systems as shown on the district map here. Our SWIM program is administered through the Natural Systems and Restoration Bureau, which is responsible for many of the district's water quality and natural system projects. This slide summarizes the SWIM program accomplishments within the Tampa Bay area through 2023. That's 34 years of partnerships to implement SWIM projects. So now we're gonna talk about Boyd Hill. The Boyd Hill Nature Preserve Freshwater Wetland Habitat Restoration Project, referred to as the Boyd Hill Project, is a cooperative funding initiative between the city of St. Petersburg, the district, and uh, the grant funding with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. The project is located in Pinellas County in the city of St. Petersburg along the southwestern shore of Lake Magori, uh, which ultimately discharges to Tampa Bay. The green shading, whoops, nope, sorry. jumped ahead. <laughs> <laughs> In the lower part of this map represents the preserve with the red star at the um, preserved entrance. How many of you have visited the oh, wonderful? Then what I'm about to tell you, you'll be familiar with that's great. <laughs> All right, now. Um, the Boyd Hill, the, well, the district and the city of St. Pete initiated the Boyd Hill project in 2019 to create, restore, and enhance about 30 acres of freshwater upland habitats to improve natural systems and to address water quality. The city's providing the property and maintenance, and the district is the lead for design and construction. The Boyd Hill project funding <clears throat> for cost of the fort design permitting and construction is a million $96,800, which includes the $200,000 grant from TBER, and the remaining costs are split 50-50 between the city and the district, with $896,800 budgeted for construction. So this map um, shows the size of the um, Southwest or the size of the preserve at 245 acres. It's open to the public with over five miles of trails and boardwalks. I sketched the approximate locations of the four work areas in red. The project objectives, like I said, were to restore and enhance tribe hydrology and freshwater wetland and upland habitats. Area one and three include reconquering drainage channels to provide more natural stream channels which will slow stream velocities and provide stormwater treatment before discharging to Lake Magori, which also ultimately discharges to Tampa Bay. Area two involves enhancing wetland areas by clearing exotic plants and linking upland runoff to downstream wetlands, directing runoff under the trail, and installation of culverts and stormwater conveyance structures are also part of Area 4 scope, which includes regrading 
uh, and hydroblasty to remove a berm that um, had disconnected wetlands from the on, on property flow. So this is a brief look at the project status. The mobilization and construction began shortly after issuing a notice to proceed to the contractor in March 2024. 20, so this is pretty new. The construction timeline is approximately 18 months with a follow-up one year of plant maintenance and establishment. That should be completed by the fall of 2026. In March, the contractor began work in Area 4. And <clears throat> he sought to work. I mean, you would think one, two, three, four, he'll do it in that order. No, he was looking at the areas that were going to be the driest. And starting there, because when the rains came, they would be the wettest and would be hard to work in. So at this point, he's worked through uh, area four, and uh, he's moved on to area two, which call for 10 and a half acres of wetland benefits. Currently, he's completing up area two and has started in area one, uh, the downstream end, which once again, it's kind of the wettest area there's going to be work in. He started grading there. So area three will be the last one he, he uh, works in, and I'm probably a few months away. So I've provided this slide just so you can be reminded about one, two, three, and four, and where they are. And in the next picture, the next slides, which are really photos, you'll see that indicator up at the top to remind you about where we're talking. So like I said, we began in area four. And this is a this is represented. Oh no, Ed, you were right on time. <laughs> so this is the reconfigured swale, which links a small upstream wetland to convey the flow downstream to a larger channel that discharges to Lake Magori. <clears throat> the downstream channel was rejoined to existing wetland areas by hydroblast. The swale was planted with wetland and transitional vegetation, which are represented by the sprigs in the swale. Squint a little bit here to see that picture. In okay, the next slide. These plants were planted in May, <clears throat> which was pretty dry. So, you know, the, the great scheme of working in the dry is wonderful and takes your plants in the ground. And then you're going, where's the rain? So there was a lot of uh, irrigation uh, watering at first, and then we got augmented by some um, some nice rainfall and wool sprigs took off. So next slide. This shows they've not only taken off, but they began to wood too. So what you're looking at our doom sunflowers blooming along the bank. And you may be able to identify the muley grass at the top of the bank and spot some bulrush or duck potato in the photo. The roots now are becoming more established and working to stabilize the soils as well as slowing down runoff to allow uh, sediments to fall out before they get to the lake. And also, there's a nutrient uptake. Uh, property to that planting as well. And I'm a real fan of bloom. So the next picture just shows you they started to bloom. This is a picture of the depth of the paint. Okay, next slide. And um, <clears throat> most of you probably realize that Tropical Storm Debbie dumped a load of rainfall on us this past weekend. <laughs> So one of our uh, one of our team went out and took some pictures of what that looked like. And here's that same swale with more water in it. Fortunately, all plants look like they're handling it just really well. And this represented about 10 inches of rain. Next slide. After Tropical Storm Debbie moved through some of the wildlife enjoyed swim, mm -hmm. I got a faint arrow. I'm not sure you can see it, but there's a little alligator floating here. <laughs> Interesting enough, he's out near the center. Yeah. He goes up higher than that, too. He can go. 
in the slide. So part of that swell, we had to go under a couple of walkways or pathways. And uh, what you're seeing here is one of the pipes that were um, installed in order to allow us to carry that flow and not disrupt those nice paths. This is a site of a large hydroblasting area in the area before. Hydroblasting opened the channel through the old berm and provided more wetland refrigeration and water capacity treatment. And ta-da, this is the same berm breach after tropical storm down. So uh, that's reconnecting uh, flows to the wetlands. So that's a rehydration uh, bonus for the project. And this sort of shows the downstream end of the Area 4 project with the yellow floating turbidity barrier. And I'm sure all of y'all know that that's a best management practice to hold back any sediments that go to downstream water line. So now I'm moving to Area 2, and I'm going to drink the water. <laughs> Area two. Um, the contractor started at the landward or the upstream edge of it by um, adding some piping and clearing some drainage ditches along the main trail through there. And the reason I included this is so you can get a feel for exactly how much non-native vegetation that the contractor was looking at removing. Uh, next slide. And this slide shows you um, okay, this is after he cleared the uh, drainage ditch. And you see a little more daylight in this one because he cleared some of that native vegetation, non native vegetation as well. And then the next slide, lots of clearing. And it shows how we're, we were um, clearing out the non natives, then sloping the area towards those wetlands that existed in the park and providing that sheet flow. Uh, to the wetlands. Next. This is the, the uh, view after um, Tropical Storm Debbie that demonstrates just how much water can be held or retained in uh, the new improved enhanced wetlands. Next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> I talked about removal of vegetation. And this is a good slide to show you. We had piles, or the contract had piles of vegetation that needed to be managed as it was pulled up. It was like using a, the surgical scalpel because there was good stuff and there was bad stuff. So the contractors teasing out the bad stuff and leaving some of the good stuff. Um, the clearing and grading generated this, these piles, which the park accepted at their storage area which was a project's cost savings as the soils and vegetation were hauled only a short distance uh, through the park trails rather than dump truck loads going out on the main drags to other possible disposal sites. Next slide. This is a view uh, also from area two, but it's down at Lake Lagori, the project um, crossed that trail and cleared some of the area just at the shore side of Lake Magori. And uh, you get a feel once again for the amount of vegetation that we're looking at managing by removing the non-native stuff. Okay. And this next one shows um, after Tropical Storm Debbie, that same area, we're looking in the same direction. And um, the standing water shows why this was the second project that he moved to on the side. Um, didn't take, well, Tropical Storm Debbie was a lot of water, but it didn't take much rain any day, 
made this a little mucky and, and a little challenging to carry soils and vegetation up to the storage area. And if you're wondering what that orange thing is at the bottom of this picture, when they were working in an area, they wanted to keep the public off that trail. So there were there were fences they put up just to ask the public to move around to a different trail, but they were there for a height that day. And this is also a picture down at the shoreline area too after Hurricane Dan. Next slide. Okay, now we're moving to area one. And <clears throat> on area one, we started at the downstream end, and this is one of the culverts. Um, the area one includes five and a half acres of wetland creation, restoration, enhancement, and four and a half acres of upland uh, restoration. This area is closer to the community garden. We're up on the north end. And looking up from that culvert upstream through that little gap in the trees, that is the drainage ditch or the drainage channel that goes to the golf course on the um, northwestern side of uh, the park. So I want you to keep in mind what this where this culvert is in terms of the project. Next. Because that culvert was, when we started the project, that culvert was the home of a mother gator and her young. And <clears throat> I was kind of relieved that the contractor was moving to the other place because she was in and out and she was a big gator. And I thought, oh, how are we going to work around this gator? Well, the, by the time he started, the gators kind of moved out of that culvert, except for this little guy who's sunning on the shoreline now. But uh, as you can imagine, the contractors kept his eye out all the time he's been looking at it. <laughs> this photo is also downstream of the culvert as he started clearing the area um, and sloping the area to provide that sheet flow I discussed earlier. The area one channel becomes less defined as it gets closer to Lake Nagori and it's. Um, and it's spreading out and shallower here. Uh, so it reduces the flow velocities so the swirls and solids have a chance to settle, settle or drop out of the water cap column before reaching. Um, have y'all heard this from me before? Are you thinking? Is she saying this over and over again? <laughs> okay, next slide. And here's a view of <clears throat> one of the native trees that got left. As I said, the surgeon's precision of leaving the good stuff and taking away the bad stuff is going on in this slide. Next. Okay, this is also the same area after the rain falls on Monday. And you can see the birds just pop back in there. Next. So now let's look at the upstream end of um, area one, and I, I wanted to give you a feel for just what that uh, drainage ditch or the drainage channel looked like. It's uh, about uh, eight to ten, 10 feet, and by the way, it's that grassy part of this slide. It's about uh, eight to ten feet deep and 20 feet wide, which is pretty narrow. So you're looking at like the Grand Canyon. Well, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> It's a cut, and it's been, you know, over time with the golf course and the neighborhood expanding, that flow coming through there over time has eroded. So the uh, project includes rerouting it, adding some contours to it, and what you're looking at, that dirt um, area to the upper right, is the new reconfigured footprint or alignment of, of the uh, ditch. And um, in the middle there is all of the uh, non-native vegetation that the contractors removed to set up for the next step, which is realigning, moving that channel. By the way, that channel, that's good. Ed. You, can, you didn't have to pop that. I just wanted to mention, told you how it looks now. 
but the reconfigured channel will be about five feet deep versus the eight to 10 feet and about 50 feet wide versus the 20 feet that is seen. So it's gonna be quite the stream when, when the contractor finishes. And so this is a little later, a few weeks or a week or two later, when we took this shot and he's got uh, piles of soil on his side, that's because he's already starting to excavate the uh, new uh, configuration, the new stream. And um, what he's doing is storing that soil here because um, the um, at the property boundaries, we're putting in two 48 inch culverts that are gonna help us redirect and keep from any, you know, uh, um, scouring of the new stream by reconnecting it with a pipe. Uh, so there's two 48 diameter pipes and uh, the piped area will provide an opportunity for a wildlife land bridge, specifically a land bridge for goat and tortoises. If you, as you all said, or most of you have been there, you know that there's a goat and tortoise population at Fort Hill. So next slide. I should have had somebody stand in front of those because 40 inch, 48 inch pipes, like they're big. <laughs> and um, and unfortunately, I mean, way out pipe, but trust me, that's, that's some movement they've got to do. So we're uh, anticipating that the pipe will be installed somewhere in, sometime in September. And just because they're good for tortoises, I have a picture of a map of the good for tortoises. Um, this actually was a survey taken uh, in 2018. All those green dots represent the gopher tortoise burrows, and the blue dots are active burrows, and the blue dots re um, represent inactive burrows. Next. So now that he's moved into area one, if you're still hiking around, you may notice some bigger excavated excavators there. Now that surgical precision is no longer needed, but the smaller ex excavator, so he's brought in some some big equipment that you'll be seeing from more than one. Okay, in summary, the 30 acres um, is about 50% complete with an estimated completion date of next June, followed with a year of plant establishment and maintenance. The 30 acre void uh, project addresses water quality improvements by slowing the runoff to allow stormwater polishing. It also addresses freshwater wetland habitat by rehydrating and expanding wetlands, removing exotics and planting native plants. Channel improvements created uh, stream habitat by broadening and providing more channel sinuosity. Finally, the project ultimately flows to Lake McGordon, which uh, discharges to Tampa Bay. So the Boyd Hill project improves water quality in Tampa Bay as well. Last slide. <laughs> the Gopher Tortoise is ready. I mean, I'm ready for any questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Oh, yes. What's the total cost of the project? Uh, let's see, it was one million ninety six I got that. One million ninety six thousand eight hundred dollars. And as you can see, construction was almost nine hundred thousand for the construction. And we're improving about thirty acres or benefit over thirty acres. You know, Nancy, it might be an unfair question. You might not be prepared to answer, but what permits did you have to pull for the project? And can you just kind of give us a feel for how long it took you to get through the permitting process? <laughs> well, you know, we're regulatory, we do regulations too, so we think. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> I want to see if you get permits faster than I do. <laughs> no, we go through the same process. Uh, there is, and I think this applies to counties too, and maybe uh, cities as well. There is a general permit for the FDEP, so we go for that too. There was no federal permit for the project? Uh, you know, there was, uh, well, there was Army Corps of Engineers. Okay. Is, yes. And uh, they required 
um, an archaeological survey, which took us a while. So altogether, I think our permitting was over a year to get the permits we needed. Thank you. Um, and you might not know the answer to this one yet, but um, with, I mean, I know we got 12 inches of rain in one spot. So do you, do you know what the delay is from Debbie and the water, the additional water from that? And um, do you kind of have, like, given that you're doing a lot of construction during the hurricane season, do you have, you know, the contingency plans to deal with potential storms and, and additional water in those during this season? When, when we um, have a contract with the contractor, he has to submit a whole bunch of things. And one thing is a hurricane preparedness plan. Mm -hmm. So we do take that into account in, uh, in all of our projects. And um, right before Tropical Storm Debbie came through, we had our uh, every two week progress meeting. And of course that was one of the agenda items. How you set up, let's, you know, bat down the hatches, so to speak. Uh, the equipment that he had on site was moved to the higher ground. Um, anything that would blow around was tied down. The turbidity barriers and silt fences were, you know, extra checked one more time. And the contractor was out there um, after the storm passed to repair any of the damage. Um, and that'll be the same kind of... Um, system that'll be in place as we go forward through the rest of the project. Of course, I'm like this. Please don't let me more get hit by big things. Did you have any plantings or anything like that that were put in the ground that were damaged and not quite ready for that kind of those kind of issues until they're a little bit older or anything like that? Well this picture thanks Ed you're just <laughs> This picture shows those guys were hanging in there, so we were thrilled. It now, area there. two, we hadn't quite finished yet, so it's not been planted, but that's on our radar for the next uh, 30 to 45 days. That area, there's, um, I think there's about, what did I say, 10 acres in area two? Um, but that, uh, some of that right now is just graded, and, the, and well, actually, it's not just graded. I didn't include the ugly pictures. <laughs> I wanted y'all to think we, we do great things, but there was there were uh, as soon as you uh, clear something, you um, have another seed source pop up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just says, "Hey, there's no trees to keep us from growing," and uh, so there's some non-native vegetation that he's killing right now because we don't want to uh, plant things when you, they're going to be out competed by the bad stuff that decided it was their turn to, to blossom and grow. But we're, we're confident as we go forward that uh, when we plant, uh, those things are, we're going to, you know, take care of them, hope for the best. If they are not, uh, if they do not survive, we, as I mentioned, there's a year establishment and plant maintenance a requirement of our contractor. So if things don't make it, he'll be out back out there with some more things. Does that answer? Or wait a minute. Anything else? Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Great. All right. Uh, Maya. <laughs> The um, real-time project progress tracking tool summary is there for you to review, and if you ever are interested in diving deeper into all of the individual project elements that we manage, you should have access to do that, and I'm happy to walk you through it if you're having um, trouble accessing any of that information. Our next meeting is scheduled for Friday, November 8th, and we'll be back at the Regional Planning Council. Anything else anybody wants to bring up? Yeah. Um, so we just had a mural dedication um, on some of our uh, RO tanks um, that's on um, County Road 580, just east of US 19. And so it's like the big, huge water tanks. And it's some really, really cool 
uh, mangrove underwater like fish that are there. And uh, so I was there the other day um, at the dedication and I've driven past the tanks a couple of times and just the perspective of it as you're driving by feels like you're kind of swimming through the mangroves and the fish are right there. And then when you walk up close, you realize just the detail of like the, the red drum has like this flash on its tail and it's really cool to see them up close, but just driving by makes it seem like you're out there snorkeling with them or really, really cool. Um, so if you're just driving through North Pinellas, um, it's on the south side of County Road at 580, um, just east of US-19. What else? Yeah, Sarah, you can put staff on the spot. <laughs> you guys talk about the Great Bay Scallop Search and National Estuaries Week coming up soon. Yeah, so on um, August 24th, we are partnering with Tampa Bay Watch to host the annual Great Bay Scallop Search. Um, historically, there was only one site um, that, they, that they had folks going out of, but we've been partnering with them over the past couple of years to expand that. So this year, we are hosting three sites that you can kind of launch from. Um, so you can leave from um, Fort DeSoto, Grand View Park on the south side of St. Pete, and now our newest site will be Emerson uh, Point down in Manatee County. And we're expanding it really so that we get a better idea of the uh, total number of scallops in Tampa Bay. So um, basically, we're looking for people if you have a boat um, and you want to go out for a couple hours and snorkel through the seagrasses to help us find scallops. Um, Please let us know or register online. Um, you can choose to go from any of those three. So, um, it usually fills up fast, but it hasn't this year as we've expanded it. So we really do need captains. <laughs> so if you're able to participate or get the word out, we would appreciate it. Yeah, you can participate from a boat, a kayak, a paddleboard, um, any of those things. Um, so yes, please register. We need bodies this year. Mostly boats. Mostly boats. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that was important. Just as another side, we actually found two scallops above the Howard Franklin Bridge in Old Tampa Bay on West Shore, along West Shore. Uh, two adult scallops. So it's. I think it's been a banner year in and around the area. I know Pasco is booming during their their short uh, open season. So the scallops are there. I think. Just need to find them and count them. Yeah. <laughs> and put them back in Tampa Bay. <laughs> Just a note on that Pasco scallop harvest is closed right now. I was going to ask you about oh, that. Yeah. If you, um, so I guess, you know, we've obviously had pyridinium in the bay for a long time, and we've always been under the impression that it's not toxic like other areas. They're not producing. Well, it's is it producing? It produces. It's not. It's not going to have overt environmental effects. It's just, okay. you know, if you're eating shellfish, and there's no legal shellfish harvest no. where we generally have those blooms. And in Pasco County, it's there's no managed shellfish harvest areas by FDAX either. So this scallop harvest season falls just like squarely on the FWC to manage that and. We have noticed, it's interesting though, because the levels of pyridinium are not what we see in the bay, like, oh, you know, 6,000 cells per liter, maybe 13 here or there. But in Anclo, in that area, the shellfish are, I, you know, I think the latest samples were like three times above the, the re regulatory limit, the action limit for PSP. And because it's recreational harvest and they're not like commercially harvested in mussel only, we have to test the whole animal. We don't just look at the mussel. But um, yeah, so they're probably closed for the rest of their season. It's not going to go well. <laughs> it's interesting this year, so we haven't really seen high counts yeah. in old Tampa Bay, again, around that 5,000 kind of cells per liter level um, kind of by Safety Harbor. And that's really been about it so far. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um, but we, we noticed it pop up in the Crystal Beach and then Anclote area and then and then pretty much 
very, very shortly thereafter, the closure notice came out. And we did just put up a map, like a pyridinium map. I was, I've was i had many people reach out to me about having the pyridinium um, data available um, on, like, upload it to the federal HABSOS as well, because then it's easier to query. But yeah. definitely had lots of folks from the public who asked for that map before you all had made it available. As soon as you did, I shared it with them, and they were like, oh, my gosh, thank you. Yeah. I know, like, there's like a lot of captains, obviously, that that had trips <laughs> scheduled out there, and so they were try hoping to track it. Yeah, but Kelly's point's an interesting one too about how we how we've communicated about the harmful nature of pyridinium. And so I, I I think we've squarely moved to to messaging it as not a nuisance bloom but a harmful one. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's different from. From Karenia, like that toxin isn't overtly ichthyotoxic. You don't see dead fish everywhere. You don't have, we haven't documented any like manatee mortalities or anything tied to pyro blooms, but you know, definitely people want to collect oysters from the bay. Like that's a really bad idea when you have blooms. Yeah, are you all testing the toxin or just the presence of the organism? Both. Okay. You said because it's not a designated shellfish harvest area for commercial, you're testing the whole animal though, not just the muscle. Yeah, so a lot of the states when they when they test scallops, it's just the muscle because it's commercially harvested and that's what is sold. But this is, you know, we just have recreational harvest here and everybody goes home with the whole scallop and you don't know what I mean, we are looking at muscle only too. I don't have a lot of data on that yet. Like where we have extra samples, we're breaking them down like that, but for management purposes, we're basing our testing on a whole, whole scale. That's useful to know because we were kind of questioning talking about that. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, one comment I'll make, Ed, and I, I, I don't remember when the article came out. It was probably shortly, maybe immediately after the closure was announced of the, the special season in Pasco, but I felt like there was a missed opportunity there to educate the public about the differences between the blooms so like within the article, it kind of equated this bloom to a red tide bloom. And as you were talking about, the impacts are different. They're no less important, but you know, we were not talking about respiratory irritation and fish yeah. bills and, and manatees and sea turtles. We're talking about different types of effects. And I thought it was a big miss in the article. It's, yeah. That's a good point. I think that the angle we were trying to go for is that, you know, with the reduced harvest in Pasco, that it's actually beneficial for the Tampa Bay population because we would likely get more larval survival sure. and recruitment into Tampa Bay because that's one of the major meta populations for our system. To so, be fair, I think I answered those questions all on background. It's just what they end up I, doing. I'm <laughs> very familiar with the report. I also, I was also really hopeful that it would, you know, be a connection for people who who don't understand what's going on in Old Tampa Bay, and obviously that angle yep. hasn't really been picked up by folks either. So, <laughs> and we've been very restricted in what we can communicate. I could tell. I can always tell because they yeah. call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, bad things don't happen in Florida. <laughs> we don't talk about. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, that's. Good to know. Um, I did want to um, let everybody know. Uh, so we're working on our vulnerability assessment, which a lot, a lot of the count, a lot of the Tampa Bay communities are. And um, we had had the discussion about CSAP and all that. Um, as a favor to DEP, um, the county took on um, assisting ten cities within the county to um, help them develop. It's a the requirement that the goal is that all Florida coastal communities have a vulnerability assessment by 2026. So um, if you're thinking about updating yours, maybe yours is a little stale, I would suggest applying for funding now. They, I think they extended the Resilient Florida deadline to sometime next week. And I just say that because after talking with them about scope and the legislative changes and stuff like that, um, it seems like they're really going to be moving away from planning into implementation. And so they're basically telling us that, well, your vulnerability assessment is going to be good until, you know, whenever. So, um, so there, there may, just may not be as much funding. I don't know. It's, 
just, they're really gonna, which is good. They're really gonna say, okay, you got your plan now, execute and we'll help fund those things. So I uh, just wanted you guys to be aware that um, if you are looking at making any updates, now would probably be the time to um, ask for some additional funding. Um, I also want to share um, every quarter, um, I host a, a, a kind of a public works forum um, at our at our campus. And most of the subjects tend to be around stormwater and vulnerability and stuff like that. Just, that seems to be the things that are environmental things that are that are in, on people's mind. Um, we did a presentation. Um, we did um, a project with the Florida Department of Transportation to evaluate three um, green infrastructure technologies on a 1970s development. It's Sunstar, where our ambulances are. Um, the DOT actually paid for the study. Um, the county did the installations, and um, BioClean was the uh, vendor they provided the actual um, green infrastructure, and we installed those. They were um, in the ground for like four years. Um, and we have all that data. The reports are like 500 pages, <laughs> but we do have them up on a site that we can share them out. Um, we got some really good numbers and probably would have been better if they had been on a better maintenance cycle. I'll just leave it there. Um, but we did um, a new rain removal was. Yeah, nutrient removal numbers. So uh, we did a rain garden, um, an upflow filter, and a, a wetland polisher. And, um, all of them are very compact, um, so they can be used for retrofits. And from a um, maintenance perspective, it's a vector truck. Uh, we did, um, all three of them use the um, engineered soils, the um, BAM. Um, so just some wanted to share that out there if you're looking to do projects because they're relatively inexpensive and um, they're not hard to, or expensive to maintain. I just want to share that. Um, oh, so uh, just a, um, our sheriff's department, um, <laughs> right now they're flying a lot of hours. They're trying, they have a helicopter that needs to go in for its full, um, I don't know if you guys have, hel I have helicopters because of mosquito control, but, um, after they had, I know, that's, <laughs> that's you are so cool. <laughs> So anyway, once you have a certain number of hours, you have to go in for a full on engine overhaul in there. They've got a helicopter that's um, approaching that. So they're trying to get all the hours done. Uh, so they were out and flew uh, Tampa Bay uh, yesterday um, and said, um, hey, is there something going on? The bay is, this was from Tuesday, but yesterday they were like, it's really dark. And I said, well, you know, we've got a lot of tannic acids probably coming into the bay from all the wetlands discharging from all the rain. We did have um, pyrodin. They got some pre-storm photos of Tampa Bay um, and the pyrodin was the, very visible. You can see the, you know, what you normally see, the reddish. Um, so they, our, our sheriff's office has gotten used to flying with us during the tide and, and beach stuff. So they've gotten very interested in it. And so just wanted to let you know that they are keeping an eye on the bay and um, they're going to go up again next week and we're going to get a bunch of photos. So we'll share those with Ed and the team and just kind of keep an eye on how the bay uh, responds to everything it just went through. So, yeah, tying on to that a little bit about um, what. Uh, after the storm, the uh, Sarasota Bay Estuary Program put in a request to the district for sampling post um, Tropical Storm Debbie. And um, there were some releases down the Kalisahatchee. And so after Ian, we mobilized and also did some sampling and found extremely low DO. Um, and I think that was probably the most impactful parameter. Um, so it was about two to four weeks before we faced all recovery in those areas post Ian. Um, we don't know yet with Debbie. I think these numbers are actually even lower. Could be just the timing of the sampling. We were able to get out there quickly. Um, Ian, it took us a while. That was obviously it was a much larger storm. So uh, Dave Tomasco, the executive director of the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, is putting this information out. He's putting it out in his I think I haven't seen it yet, but uh, typically he puts something out on their website, their Facebook pages, um, his LinkedIn page as well. So since the request came from him, that's where you'll see that information. But I just want to let folks know that um, you know we did help with that sampling event. That's out there. We'll see what that data shows and 
what that means for those areas and recovery. He does think that the impacts are probably because the the bays were estuary areas were so healthy um, at the beginning of this because of the work that they've been implementing and that the communities around it um, that it's likely able to take those impacts and rebound more quickly too. But we'll see. So stay tuned for that. So you do that monitoring at the request of different organizations. So no samples were collected for Tampa Bay. No, this was a specific request from the um, Sarasota Bay Estuary Program. It it happened originally after Ian yeah. for just that area and just the time frame. So I think there's going to be maybe two, maybe three sampling events, and that that will be it. Uh, and that was typical of what happened. That's why I was going to say That's what happened after Ian. Um, and so this was an area that they thought would be impacted from some of those releases. Mm -hmm. And they are paying for um, certain parameter samplings. Um, I think the district is pitching in some and obviously the in-kind services having staff available for that. So it's kind of a- It is your lab project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was at least, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get the, you mentioned it during the director's report to Tampa Bay, uh, observational network that USF just established. So there, there's going to be some real-time information in Tampa and Bay now from that monitoring network, and there should be some real-time DO measurements uh, to kind of see what the base response is. So, That'd be good to compare. Yeah. Well, yeah. Some, I, I noticed that, at least from just from the news, that um, down in Sarasota, the Philippi Creek um, area really got hit hard, and I know that happens to be an area of a lot of septic um, are they looking at any of the what happened in Parish is pretty pretty yeah. incredible and unprecedented as well. Yeah, it's just uh, I just wonder, yeah. you know, it's one thing when an area that's sewered, um, you know, gets it like that. It's another thing when yeah. it's all septic. You know, what that looks like. If they're kind of doing separate monitoring to kind of look at those impacts. Yeah. All right. Well, that was sad. Anybody <laughs> got any happy things to talk about? What you're doing this weekend? I have some happy things. I know yes. other volunteer events. So September 21st through the 28th is National Estuaries Week. So Carly has been working very um, hard on getting a bunch of events planned. So please stay tuned for um, the announcement of those different events. We'll have some volunteer opportunities like a give a day with the bay, as well as some experiential education opportunities and some opportunities for staff to kind of learn um, about different topics um, estuary related. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is the second annual Tampa Bay Debris Derby is happening on October 5th. And so if you remember last year, we um, kind of piloted this project um, and so this is a trash collection tournament. So um, please come out and participate. We have a variety of um, different um, private organizations that are donating products for raffle prizes that you can win. Um, NOAA was the one who won the, who brought in the most trash last year. So they're the ones with the prestigious title of the heavyweight champion. Um, so please get your crews together and try to take them on and beat them for this year's conference. There is a belt, like World Wrestling. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know why she's not leading with that. <laughs> Prices <laughs> <Why's> a <laughs> <the> matter. <laughs> power poles, if your boats need power poles, they're up for raffles. So. Power poles, there's also boat is um, donating potentially to uh, blow up paddle boards. So there should be some really awesome prizes this year. So there for these. <laughs> awesome. All right. Anything else for the good of the group? Quiet people at the end of the table. Okay. Well, with that, the meeting is adjourned.